So I'm really excited. So we have a special guest this evening and also author. I just, I, can I just say like my fantasy is to do Reading Rainbow. So like even introducing this book just brings me a smile on my face. Um, this is an, so this is um, called Wednesday Afternoons uh, with Dr. J, Dr. Je Jonathan Jenkins. Um, who's an assistant in psychiatry at Mass General, um, graduated with a BS in health science and psychology from Guilford College and also obtained master and doctoral degrees in clinical psychology from the University of Denver Graduate School of Professional Psychology. Um, I'm really, really excited to have Jonathan onto the show, a little bit about the author segment. Um, he was born and raised in Natick, Massachusetts, and also fell in love with the Celtics and cookie dough ice cream. So I'm really excited to have Jonathan on. I'm going to welcome him without further ado, tonight's guest, Dr. Jonathan Jenkins. Hey. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Welcome to Cafe Con Cas. Thank you. Happy to be here. Uh, yeah, and um, how are you doing this evening? Can you do a little emotional check-in for us, or how are how are you doing? I'm I'm doing all right. I was yeah. watching the Patriots game. We were behind when I left the house, so oh, I'm no. a little nervous right now. I'm holding okay. a little bit of tension in. Okay. So okay. we'll see what happens. Wonderful. Um, yeah. So how are the Patriots doing this season? I haven't. They're doing I'm well. A baseball fan. Okay. Doing well, but okay. uh, they're not doing well right now. Okay. It's problematic. So that causes. Do you find that the sports team invokes more anxiety or collective like? How, how is the pulse of sports right now? Is it... uh, pulse of sports in Boston is pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good. We're on a little bit of an up twig. Okay. So it's, okay. it's been great. Wonderful. Yeah. All right. So um, author and psychologist, can you tell me a little bit about your work? I know you engage with both um, adult and children populations. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of support and services do you offer um, as a psychologist? Sure. So at the hospital, I work with children and adolescents with a variety of issues and concerns and challenges. So that might be anything from depression or anxiety, it could be trauma related, it could be substance abuse related, so mm -hmm. kind of a catch-all for anything that comes in. Mm -hmm. Not only do we work with them, but we also work with the family and the community partners, so that could be teachers, could be other medical professionals, could be DCF, could be Department of Mental Health, so that's kind of the MGH side. Mm -hmm. And then the private practice side is adults and children. A lot of the people I see are kind of 25 to 35, so young professionals, mm -hmm. uh, people entering what we call a quarter life crisis, mm -hmm. and really trying to figure out what their identity is mm -hmm. and how to move in the world with less resistance and more success. Hmm. And so, in what uh, what brought you what brought you into psychology and uh, what um, yeah, how did you first get into psychology? Uh, I think it was really had to do with. Um, having an interest in the medical profession in mm -hmm. general, but not necessarily being uh, all that excited about blood mm. and <laughs> getting a little bit dizzy when I saw blood. So okay. I figured, how could I have the bedside manner of being a doctor yeah. with not dealing with all that blood and guts and broken bones and things like that? And I really gravitated to the relational aspect of psychology yeah. and building a relationship with somebody and allowing that relationship to grow and foster and develop and, and having those challenges and also those successes uh, being a, allowed to be analyzed and allowed to grow in a, a particular way. What, in what ways do you establish trust with patients? Like when a, first, when a patient first comes in, obviously you're a stranger to them, but they're seeking help. What mm -hmm. is the process of connecting with the patient and helping them do that difficult work? So in psychology, we call that the therapeutic alliance. Mm -hmm. And what that means is the relationship between the clinician and the patient or the client. Or if you're working with children, you're not only worried about the relationship that you have with a child, but you're also worried and concerned about the relationship you have with the family system. So the parents, the other siblings, it also then could extend to the teachers and the other community partners who are directly involved with the child. So a great way to do that is authenticity. Hmm. Kind of let them know who you are and who you're not. Hmm. So with children, what I tell them is I'm here to talk about feelings and emotions. I'm not somebody who's going to give you medication because I'm not a psychiatrist. Right, 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 right. Uh, I'm not going to lock you in jail or get mad at you if you get angry. Mm -hmm. But we're going to be curious and we're going to be brave about our emotions and that's how we're going to start. And so non-judgmental and kind of having this positive regard mm -hmm. for the kids that I work with and the same thing for the adults too, being really authentic about this is what I can deliver and mm -hmm. this is what I can't. I can't promise you that you'll never be sad again. Mm -hmm. I can't promise you that your next... Um, death in the family or breakup won't be that bad. But mm -hmm. what I can promise you is we're going to help you get through those situations a lot more uh, efficiently uh, in a healthier fashion uh, and with a lot more authenticity and a lot more honesty about how you mm -hmm. feel and how that impacts your behavior and your thoughts and your feelings. 
Do you usually experience a willingness from patients or there are some resistance from clients that you've worked from, worked uh, with? I think a lot of people are actually nervous and concerned about getting better. Mm. I think they get so entrenched in their, uh, their normal. So if their normal is depression or if their normal social isolation mm -hmm. or helplessness, they really get entrenched in that. And to think about climbing out of that cave and experiencing the world in a different fashion can be really overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what I do is support them through that process so that they know that they can really be successful if they decide to make that change and also give them small incremental steps towards change as opposed to giant step after giant step after giant step because we can all understand how that would be overwhelming for us. Mm. So I want to make it manageable and that's what I really do with both adults and the children say, hey, let's take this piece by piece. We don't need to solve all the problems right away, but let's make slow, deliberate, um, concerted efforts yeah. to to go towards progress. And as we make that progress, I can check back in with them and say, wow, remember three months ago, you know, you couldn't have a conversation without getting anxious in public. Mm -hmm. Now, look, you just had a, um, you gave a public talk in your class, or you just, you know, asked somebody to dance at a concert or something like that. That's progress. Mm -hmm. And if you give them the opportunity to recognize that progress, they're more motivated to do so in the future. So what kind of skills does it take um, for you to be a successful psychologist? Is it patience or what type of skill set do you, like, have you, what are the skills you found have found most useful mm. and where did they come from? Was it all from school that you learned these skills or something outside? That's a good question. Um, I think patience is definitely a key skill. I think a, a sense of being able to adjust and react to situations. So for some people I work with, humor is really key and we need humor to move mm -hmm. the therapy forward. For other people, humor doesn't work and you can't, <laughs> you can't be funny. Yeah. So you have to be able to have that, uh, that spectrum in how you behave and how you interact with people. Mm -hmm. I'm a different person for my child patients than I am for my adult patients. And I have to be able to feel comfortable in that. So it means a little bit of breadth of, of um, personality. Mm. Uh, but I think you also have to be able to feel the temperature in the room. I think we've all been in conversations and situations where we feel like the air gets sucked out of the room mm -hmm. or you mm -hmm. feel that mm -hmm. heat from like a really good night and people are mm -hmm. laughing and people are really in tune with each other. Being able to be that thermometer, that psychological thermometer and see whether you know the room's getting cold or it's getting hot mm -hmm. and being able to adjust accordingly is really important. Mm -hmm. But I think that patience is key. Mm -hmm. uh, in good therapy sessions, I actually won't talk that much. Mm. And I'll just kind of give little key words and suggestions that kind of move the person's thought along um, on a particular path that I may be dictating or a particular path that was completely organic and came out of nowhere. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And do you feel uh, lessons in patience? Uh, is it, did you learn that in school or is it, have you always been, would you always describe yourself as a patient person or do you no. feel like with the profession? <laughs> okay, that's interesting. No. That's interesting. Um, <laughs> So I think I've been patient with myself. Uh, mm. As a child, I had pretty bad speech language concerns. Mm. Uh, so I had to do speech therapy, and I had really bad asthma, too. So there were a lot of times that I missed recess for speech therapy or missed recess for asthma because the pollen was outside or I couldn't breathe or I didn't take my medication. Mm -hmm. So in those circumstances, I had learned patience. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be outside, but I had to keep my body still. I had to stay inside for my own safety and my own... Uh, betterment if I was doing the speech language services. So in those times, I was able to stay a patient by directing my attention to, towards something else. Mm -hmm. So if I had to be inside, I'm going to draw. Mm -hmm. Or if I have to do speech language therapy, I'm going to do it the best I can. Mm -hmm. So I can get something out of this time that I'm missing doing something else, uh, as opposed to seeing it as wasted time. But with my patients, I really do feel like working that patience to understand how difficult it is and how sacred the space is in the, in the respect that I'm having conversations with people that they don't talk to anybody else about. Mm. And that these are words that are being uttered that it may never have been uttered ever in life before. And I really have to hold that and, and really treat that as sacred. I think therapy really is a sacred space. Mm -hmm. So because of that, it deserves that patience. It deserves that respect. It deserves that time. Mm. Because we're asking people to make monumental changes in their life if they're going through an acute depression or uh, debilitating anxiety mm -hmm. or the loss of a loved one or uh, you know their own health crisis mm -hmm. how can I ask them to get through this quickly right. that that seems so disingenuous and kind of inhumane right. to ask that so speaking of getting through things quickly the training mm -hmm. to become a psychologist is 
long. Mm -hmm. How different is your was your student life from now your clinical life? What is the different? How, what has been the different biggest difference between the two settings? Um, just that made me think. Just to think about the the process of grad school for psychology, mm -hmm. there are these two tracks. You're learning about how to work with your patients and mm -hmm. your clients, but you're also learning about yourself. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're doing an MBA program, then I don't know the level of self reflection that you have to do. Um, so I think that that self-reflection really helps you develop and really analyze the areas of your life where you need work for yourself mm -hmm. and also how those areas in your identities may rub off or influence positive or negatively the people you work with. Mm -hmm. So my ability to recognize I am a man, I am a tall, imposing man, mm -hmm. I am a person of color, mm -hmm. how does that rub off on people? Mm -hmm. How would that impact a five-year-old little boy who looks like me, mm -hmm. who can see this big kind of hulking person standing in front of him. And how does that influence what they feel comfortable saying, what they don't feel comfortable saying, and how we move the therapy along. Mm -hmm. So I really do think about that. When I step into the room, what, is, what do I give away? What are people taking mm -hmm. from my appearance? And then given that information, how do I then agree with what they perceive? Or how do I then work to kind of dismantle the prejudices or p potential stereotypes that might inhibit the treatment. Mm -hmm. And what, can you give me an example of a way that, um, ha have you actually encountered that in your process where being mm -hmm. a person of color has made someone um, be uncomfortable? For sure, for sure. Um, one of the things that I really do kind of lean on is the fact that I am a male, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of the kids I work with, unfortunately, don't have positive male role models. Mm. So if nothing else, the most important for, thing for me to be is a non-offending, safe, emotionally intelligent, emotionally aware male. Mm. So that I can then be a re restorative, reparative figure for people who haven't had those types of experiences. Mm -hmm. So for instance, I'm working with a lot of 8 to 10, 8 to 12 year old boys have a lot of anger management concerns mm -hmm. and they may have seen people in their community males in their community utilize anger in a particular way and they might show that anger in aggressive means mm -hmm. but if they see me in the office I can talk about times that I got angry mm -hmm. um, and show them how I distilled that anger into a productive resource mm -hmm. how I felt those feelings and I didn't hit anybody I didn't hurt myself and I didn't do anything to disrespect myself, my name, my family, or my community. Right. And I think that that's really important. Um, in terms of as an African-American male or person of color, um, I recently wrote an article about it, how after a family session, we were going to get another family member involved in the session. Mm. And one of the parents said, right as she left, she was leaving the parking lot, oh, don't worry, I told my daughter that you were black. And it was this weird throwaway comment for her mm. that... It seemed like she was trying to give me a sense of security and, and understanding, mm -hmm. but it was very confusing to me because in my life I've never had to warn anybody that I was black. Wow. And so this was in grad school. I got a lot of supervision around it, but it was a situation where I was like, ah, that's right. Therapy's not a closed environment. It's permeable to mm -hmm. race and prejudice and stereotyping. And from that point on, I was really able to acknowledge, okay, this is what I bring into the room. I bring in my race for better or for worse. Mm. And there are also opportunities where I can capitalize on that, where I can speak a certain language to certain types of people and get that buy-in. And now right. we're off and running. Right. Whereas if they see somebody else walk into their room, they go, oh, here we go again. This is going right. to be somebody who has the potential to misunderstand me, somebody who has the potential to offend me. Microaggressions might be here, but they right. see me and they know me and they say, ah, he give him a little test, see how he is with the lingo or with the music or with the culture. Mm. And if you pass that test, now you're in. You have that access. Wow, that's that's incredible, and also quite it quite necessary. Um, and in the in the only in the three minutes that we have left, um, mm -hmm. I know did, in your training in your schooling, did you encounter a lot of other people of color in your programs, or was it? Um, a little bit more isolating that because I know with faculty there's a little bit of a disparity between white and color faculty. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it was a pretty solitary experience. Mm. Uh, so the stats on psychology, I think it works out to be about three to five percent of psychologists are African American. Oh, wow. So let's say, let's take the typical 100 people. Yeah. So let's say there are five African Americans. Yeah. And then you take those five African Americans and we say how many are male and how many are female. Right. It's overwhelming majority are female. Right. So let's say three females, two males. 
Right. Then we say of those two males, how many of them work with children? So most African American male psychologists yeah. work with adults. Okay. So then that would probably leave one if we're okay. lucky. So in terms of being an African American male, that's a psychologist yeah. that works with kids. Yeah. It's a very isolating experience. Okay. But I see it as a very rewarding thing Definitely. because I can be a role model and dress professionally yeah. and be able to use my credentials to give access yeah. and advocacy for people who don't have a voice yet. Yeah. And really giving them the opportunity to say, hey, this profession is available to you if you want it. Exactly. Uh, just go out and get it. Well, thank you so much for paving the way and joining us this evening. We have run out of time. And um, where can we actually where can we go and purchase your book? Uh, you can purchase it on Amazon.com. Okay, uh, check us out on Amazon.com. And um, yeah, thank you for paving the way. And I hope that through your work, you're able to uh, enable more um, students to overcome those obstacles so they can really fulfill their purpose because anxiety can get in the way depression can really get in the way and sure. um, yeah I thank you so much